introduce our next speaker, uh, Emily Kudenik Moore, uh, Dr. Emily Kudenik Moore from Colorado State University and originally from Ketchikan. Instead, it is and perhaps always was 
more about Seward's failure to recognize the status and sovereignty of Chief Evitz and his Tantaquan people, and of their claims to the land and waterways that Seward claimed to buy. Evitz recognized Seward's statue and honored him with appropriate gifts, but Seward did not recognize Evitz. And from this initial misrecognition followed a series of more misrecognitions that left the Tantaquan as one of five landless communities that is still not recognized in Franksa. The Seward Pole offers a physical reminder of this larger struggle for the recognition of Alaska Native claims and rights in the Alaska Sesquicentennial, and its social biography charts this series of misrecognitions from the time of Seward's first visit to Alaska. I want to begin by acknowledging that, by most accounts, Seward was a good guy. He was an abolitionist who housed fugitives in the Underground Railroad in his basement, supported free education for women in his home state of New York, and became Lincoln's ablest statesman during the course of the Civil War. As Lincoln's right-hand man, he was targeted for assassination the same night that Lincoln was shot in Ford's theater, although Seward survived his attack and the scars and the mishap and jaw that he bore as a result later impressed Klingit leaders he visited in Klaquan. And some of you, I'm not sure how many of you already know, many of you probably know these stories, but um, Chief Cole Cook of, of Klaquan was apparently so impressed with Seward and his statesmanship that he carved, he tattooed his name into his arm. But his reputation among the Tantaquan Klingits of southern southeast Alaska is very different and points to another aspect of Seward's legacy. Seward was an ardent expansionist, believing that the United States should dominate not only North, North America, but also trade routes in the Pacific that paved the way for the global flow of American goods and dollars. One historian called him, quote, an apostle of manifest destiny, quote, a person driven by a ravenous expansionist credo that the United States should spread farther than the shores of North America. Seward bought Midway Island in the Central Pacific and tried to buy islands in the Caribbean the same year that he bought Alaska from Russia in 1867. In all of these transactions, Seward did not consider the claims of indigenous peoples to their lands. And it is this lack of recognition that troubles many, uh, many Tantaquan peoples in the celebration of the Alaska Sesquicentennial. The original version of the Seward Shame Pole was erected sometime in the 1880s, more than a decade after Seward had visited Tom's village, and after it was clear that he was not coming back to reciprocate the honors of the 1869 potlatch. The original pole depicted Seward at the top, wearing a spruce root hat piled with three woven discs to indicate his status, and sitting on a bentwood box that served as a pointed symbol of the many gifts he had been given as Evitz's guest of honor. According to most accounts, his face was painted white and his ears and nostrils red as a mark of shame. Although elsewhere I've heard that these red markings aren't necessarily a mark of shame. That's how um, Tantaquan Tekwedi Plinkets interpret these colors. So it's really my interpretation as well. The accounts differ on what exactly happened at Tongas Village in 1869. Tantaquan tradition holds that of its gifted Seward tons of furs, blankets, and other presents befitting his rank when Seward made a brief stop at the U.S. military fort, Tongas Island. Curiously, however, Seward made no mention of a potlatch at Fort Tongas in his own autobiography. He did note meeting, quote, an intelligent chief and going into his spacious house, but there was no remark of any major gathering, and whatever diplomatic favors he received, he apparently felt were returned by inviting the chief's family to dine with him for dinner on the active, that was his ship. He did note several gifts that he took home with him from Thomas Village, among the most prized, a bald eagle that had been injured by a hunter, and which Seward kept at his home in Auburn, New York, as a symbol of the coat of arms of the American nation state that he had helped expand to Alaska. If Seward had not noticed an important diplomatic exchange, however, Chief Evitz had. And he was deeply offended when Seward did not reciprocate by recognizing Evitz's own stature as head of the Southern Village. The Seward Pole stood at Thomas Village for the next 50 years, waiting for the offensive index to be recognized and resolved by the offending party. But recognition was not forthcoming. 
coming. Seward himself died in 1872, just three years after the Tongass potlatch. Meanwhile, his purchase of Alaska sent a new wave of American settlers into Tonta Farm lands, bringing the poisons of smallpox and whiskey with them. Chief Ebbets died in 1892, and a few years later, most of the other Tonta Kwanklinget agreed to re relocate to a summer fishing camp at the mouth of Hitchcan Creek, Ketchikan, <coughs> where the Episcopal Church promised a mission and a permanent school. At the same time, the Sanya Kwanklinkets from the nearby village of Cape Fox moved to a site they named Saxon, just south of Ketchikan, where the Presbyterian Church would provide a mission and a school. These relocations began in 1894, and because of the promises to church missions not to partake in heathen customs, few new totem poles were erected in the new villages. The only Tantaquan pole that was erected in Ketchikan, the Kajuk or Chief Johnson pole, was soon edged out by the hundreds of non-native settlers who encroached on Tongass lands, building a sawmill, dock, and even a baseball field at low tide. The second iteration of the Seward Pole arose around this time in 1940, when a New Deal program overseen by the U.S. Forest Service and the Civilian Conservation Corps began to restore totem poles and lands that the government called the Tongass National Forest, but what Clinkett and Haida people claimed as their own clan lands. This was yet another case of misrecognition, for the Forest Service initially passed over the Seward Pole at Tongass Village because its relatively plain shaft did not recommend it as worthy of restoration. It was not until a student of the famous anthropologist Fran, Franz Boas told the Forest Service that the pole was, quote, of exceptional interest, that the agency decided to have it replicated for the new totem park that it was sponsoring at Saxman. And just to be clear, Saxman, of course, is Sanya Kwan territory, but this was a Tanta Kwan pole, so this was part of this mixing that the Forest Service and the New Deal program kind of encouraged in, in the 1930s and early 40s. Even then, the Forest Service went ahead with replicating the Seward pole without knowing its full story. In December 1940, one Forest Service official noted that, quote, we have been unable to obtain anything on the story of the Secretary of State pole from Clinkins and Ketchikan or Saxman, or Saxman due to their being continually indisposed, unquote. Another Forest Service official noted, quote, it is strange that so little seems to be known of the Secretary of State poll. It makes one suspect that there is more to the story behind it than natives want to divulge, and that they are reluctant to tell the real history, unquote. Perhaps they were. One wonders if the Forest Service would have continued to pay Clinkett men the old in the Civilian Conservation Corps to replicate the poll if they knew it shamed the very government that agency was representing. But by 1948, when the Forest Service published a guidebook to the totem pole at Saxon, the story had come out with the rather diplomatic quote that I read to you at the beginning, quote, Seward did not repay either the courtesy or the generosity of his hosts, and the pole was erected to remind the Tongass people of this fact. The CCC version of the sewer pole was carved by Charles Brown, the lead carver at the Saxon CCC camp, whose work I've discussed in a previous clan conference. Brown was the son of William Brown, a Tongass Tequiti man who belonged to the same clan as Chief Evans. And although I have no evidence to confirm it, I would be very surprised if the young Charles Brown did not know the story of this pole through his own father. From what I can tell of the few photographs of this pole, Brown was faithful to the original in his replication, carving Seward sitting on the Benwood box, wearing the potlatch hat, and his face painted white with red ears and nostrils. The pole now stood on Sonia Kwan land, part of this larger mixing of Kwans and clans that the New Deal totem parks originated, but it was still clearly recognized as a Tanta Kwan pole and the Sonia Kwan, its caretakers. The significance of this pole to the Tanta Kwan was also not forgotten, for Charles Brown and many other descendants of Chief Evans were working at this very moment for the U.S. to recognize Tanta Kwan claims to native lands. In 1940, Brown's father, William Brown, had helped to incorporate the Tanta Kwan as the Ketchikan Indian Corporation under the New Deal's Indian Reorganization Act. 
Brown and others were active members of the Alaska Native Brotherhood, which had organized the Clinkett and Haida settlement for the U.S. Court of Claims. In 1959, the Ketchikan Indian community was included in the Clinkett and Haida lands claim settlement, where the U.S. Court of Claims recognized that, quote, the Clinkett and Haida Indians exclusively used and occupied most of Southeast Alaska at the time of purchase in 1867, and that the land had not been abandoned by the Indians prior to the dates of taking, and that they were owed money for the lands the U.S. had appropriated. However, the Ketchikan Indian community was not included in the 1971 Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, or ANCSA, in part because Ketchikan was considered modern and urban in character, and the Tanta Kwan or Tongass peoples remain one of the five landless communities in Southeast Alaska today. This is fast forwarding through a long and difficult struggle for Aboriginal claims in Alaska, which I don't have time to deal detail fully here. But it is to note that through all of this, the Seward Poll stood as witness to this struggle. In 2014, after nearly 70 years of standing in the Saxman Totem Park, the CCC era poll began to deteriorate, and it was actually cut down when they noticed parts of it fall off and almost hit a tourist who was walking in the park. But the issues represented in the poll were not resolved, so the city of Saxman decided to commission a third vision third version to keep its mes message standing, choosing Ketchikan resident and Clinkett artist Stephen Jackson to create a new poll. Jackson, who's well known for his contemporary take on traditional Northwest Coast carving, chose to create a new kind of portrait for Seward. He said that close study of the old poll seemed to suggest some aspects of caricature, like the fact that the man's neck bulged out of its too small neckline, and then he seemed to lean forward slightly in his eagerness to get the goods, as Jackson said. Jackson notes that many early Northwest Coast portraits of Euro-Americans blended realism and caricature, like the famous Haida Argelite sculptures of Euro-American sailors with their bulging eyeballs and arms akimbo. So Jackson did this as well for Seward's face. He studied many photographs of Seward and chose to portray the famous stabbing wounds and broken jaw that Seward sported after the 1865 assassination attempt. And you may know that um, David Rubin, who created the bronze sculpture in Juno, also included these scars, even though there's a lot of controversy because Seward himself wasn't proud of them. But the head is huge for the body, the blue eyes bulge, and Stephen did paint the nostrils and ear creases red to acknowledge the continued shame of, of an offense that has still not been put to rest. The total poll raising held in Saxman on April 29th was not widely publicized, due in part to local controversies surrounding the poll. Beginning in 2015, a local non-native woman who works as a tour guide in the Totem Park has circulated a petition complete with a three-ring binder full of travel plans and stage deadlines urging Saxman Clinkets to invite descendants of the Seward family to Saxman in order to repay Seward's debts and remove the shame of the poll. The woman had gone so far as to contact Seward's descendants in New York, the Messenger family, who were initially interested in the idea, but who rejected the payback potlatch when they learned that it had not originated with the Clinket community itself. The women's proposals were explicitly timed to remove Seward's shame before the new bronze monument was erected in Juneau. As she wrote in a public petition, quote, if the Seward Clinket potlatch was held July 1st, 2017, the Seward family could continue on to Juneau for the July 4th celebration. With the debt paid in full and peace offering accepted, the burdens lifted. The dedication of the Seward bronze statue is a new beginning for everyone, unquote. While these proposals in this three-ring binder are perhaps extreme, they do suggest a larger pressure at times for Native people to get over colonial history, to move on after a single ceremony that is supposed to set it right. Tanta Kwan people in Saxman have resisted these pressures throughout the years of fighting for recognition, land claims, and status under ANGSA, and it will take more than a single ceremony to undo the debts tied up in the Seward Pole. Willard Jackson, one of the elders in the Tonta Kwan Tekwedi Bear Clan, told me that another branch of the Seward 
family in Nebraska is very serious about repaying their great, 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 great grandfather's debt to the Tantaquan people. But while Jackson would welcome a potlatch, he was not sure it would mean that the pole would be chopped down, chopped up and burned down after this particular debt had been repaid. As Jackson said, quote, there are other things that are still not resolved. He suggested that one option would be to raise a crane beside the pole and remove the red from the ears and nostrils of Seward's face to remove this particular shame for this particular figure, but to continue to use the pole to tell a story of healing that can take place through treating other human beings with dignity and respect. But he's not sure yet what will happen if the Seward family does repay this historic potlatch. Those are decisions that his older brother, Milton Jackson, head of the Tantaquan and Take Waiti, will decide when the time comes. So the story is to be continued. What is certain, however, is that the poll continues to serve an important function for the Tantaquan community, particularly in this year of the Alaska sesquicentennial. As Stephen Jackson said at the totem pole raising in April, quote, it's an honor to keep the complexity of this story alive, unquote. This complexity is especially important because the sewer shame pole was not referenced in any of the signage posted near the bronze monument itself. It was not referenced in the official books that have been released about the Alaska sesquicentennial, though I do hasten to note that the Alaska State Library invited Stephen Jackson, aka Jack Jackson Paulus, to speak on this poll, and that Lieutenant Governor Byron Malott currently has an exhibit featuring the poll up in Juneau. So there has certainly been work to um, kind of put these monuments in dialogue. But it's a pity, in my opinion, that the pool is not mentioned in the permanent signage framing the Seward Monument so that it becomes an enduring symbol of the work of Alaska Native communities to be recognized for their status as equals and for their rights to Aboriginal claims. In this time of intense national debate over Confederate monuments and what we choose to literally cast in bronze for the future of public memory, it seems especially urgent to include counter-narratives to the official ones we portray and to honor the important story that the sewer shameful has to tell. Go